Hello and thank you for joining us. My name is Ben Sheen. I'm a managing editor here at Stratfor. And I'm joined today by Paul Floyd, military analyst. And we'll be talking about ongoing situation in Iraq and Syria involving the Islamic State. Paul, we obviously focus very intensively here at Stratfor on what the Islamic State is doing, both the Islamic State in their core territories spanning across Syria and Iraq, as well as other affiliate groups and even lone wolves who fly under the Islamic State banner. What are we seeing currently in the overall battle space? What you're seeing right now, basically, is Islamic State is having a lot of success in Syria, specifically. You know, they had uh, initial success last month that made a lot of headlines in Ramadi, but that was actually contained relatively quickly with Iraqi security forces. And so while the city has been taken, there hasn't been like an ongoing advance towards, you know, further areas like towards Baghdad. Um, but in Syria, they've been able to take advantage of the situation of the fighting between the other rebels and the Syrian regime uh, in Idlib province. So what that's created is this space for them to expand once again. And this is really their, their, their core tactic or, or their core strategy, if you will, is, is exploiting weaknesses and all these disparate actors surrounding them. Um, because a lot of these actors are, you know, in this case, not even working together, they're shooting at each other, and they, can, and they can take advantage of that. And it's interesting in Syria because you have a diverse range of, like you said, actors involved there. As well as the Islamic State component, you also have the rebels who are fighting the Assad regime, who is in turn supported by countries such as Iran and Russia. How does this affect the dynamic on the ground, really? Well, it, let's focus internally first. You've like three main actors fighting, as you say, and it's kind of actually unique to have three f actors uh, fighting each other separately, and it creates weird incentives. Uh, you know, the, the math there being always, you could basically, you know, if I'm any given side, I want to kind of always gang up with at least one partner or the other and exploit, you know, use that to my advantage. So we lots of times we're seeing Islamic State you know, fighting the rebels kind of almost, it's not in cooperation with the regime, but it's at the same time because it makes the most sense. But then they'll turn around and attack the regime shortly thereafter. Um, and, and so this three-way dynamic is very complicated and confusing because everyone's trying to take what advantage they can when it presents itself. Now let's talk about the external actors, which kind of are, are the periphery or everyone who has a certain type of interest in Syria. Um, and it makes it even that much more complicated and confusing as everyone's trying to not only work for interest of people on the ground, but their own self-interest, um, what they might be able to exploit. So, you know, Iran has an interest to keep the regime alive, to help support a lot of its kind of proxy Shia groups across the entire region. And at the same time, we have Saudi Arabia and the GCC supporting certain uh, elements of the rebels. You have the U.S. kind of on the outside who's very concerned mostly about the Islamic State, actually. But that's complicated for them because supporting the rebels is a, like supporting Islamic State light, basically. There's lots of extremism in, within those rebels, so they can't find the right people on the ground to work with. So the United States actually is probably suffering the worst in many ways of what it wants to accomplish because its main focus is on Islamic State. And trying to find, you know, its core strategy against Islamic State, if you look at Iraq, is let's take, you know, local ground forces, couple it with air power, logistics, and, and, and training, and have those ground forces basically then be effective and degrade and ultimately destroy Islamic State. But you don't have that in Syria. In Iraq, that's kind of working, albeit painfully, and in and, and some places very poorly. Uh, you don't have that at all in Syria right now. And that, that's probably the, the biggest concern for us when we look at the success of Islamic State is because these dynamics in Syria are creating a lot more space for Islamic State to grow and be more powerful. And it's that fractured environment which is really allowing that. So if you're al-Assad at the moment, what's going through your head? Because you've got to you know, appease the Alawite core, and it's really a battle for existential survival for them. But also you have all these different players in the game. You have Hezbollah who are getting involved. You've got to deal with the rebels on the one hand, Islamic State on the other. There's the option possibly that the Russians are getting cold feet. Do you think the regime's in a sustainable position? It depends on what kind of time scale we're talking. I mean, when you, when you ask me what the motivation of the Assad regime is right now, it, it, the, the single biggest imperative is survival. They're in an existential fight, and they know it. Um, so as much as there's stress on this core and this community and they, or this group, um, they also know that if they just give up or, or lay down, that, that they very likely will, will suffer terrible losses and maybe some kind of atrocity. So they have very much of an incentive to hold together despite all the stress on the regime. Um, in the sense of, of, you know, how do they work this from here on out, it's basically about maintaining as much as they can. Um, so continually we'll see them retrench and retrench on what they prioritize. Internally what they're prioritizing is basically that core around Damascus um, and the Alawite uh, coast over in Latakia province um, and the transit routes in between. 
And so that, that is the most important place for them to, to hold, absolutely. So what we may see in the future is they're under more stress, where they've been holding different pockets in different corners of Syria. They may be retrenching those forces to further bolster that core and at least keep a little statelet within Syria alive. And that will give them a long time. Uh, you know, and we've seen Iran especially kind of double down in support, um, getting Hezbollah to get more involved, uh, both in this battle space, giving more money. We're seeing fighters flow um, in support of the regime from, from Iran. Um, they're using Afghani and Pakistani refugees from within Iran, along with IRGC um, and other you know, militiamen are all being pushed to, to help the regime to kind of double down and keep it safe and at least keep that core surviving. So we're kind of looking at the de facto, you know, uh, carving out of different absolute spheres of influence over time. But that being said, the regime in that little tight packed area has a lot of staying power still, and the rebels are still very fractured in many ways. So it, this is not by any means, you know, a, a, a nearly done thing. Very much so. Well, Paul, thank you so much for explaining the complexities of the overall battle picture. For more tactical updates and deep analysis on Syria, Iraq and the Islamic State, please continue reading Stratfor.com.